Hi, everyone, and welcome to Found You Virtual Events. Um, thank you for tuning in, and I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Joyce. I'm the Field Marketing Manager here at Foundry, and I'm here with my colleague, Christy Anselmo, Director of Product at Foundry, and Anais Blanca, Associate Product Manager here at Foundry. Uh, before we dive straight into with Steve Wright, I just wanted to share a few updates on what's happening here at Foundry and with the new family. So firstly, we've got 19 on-demand webinars available now. So make sure you check those out on foundry.com forward slash events. For any questions, um, feedback, or you want to participate, um, you can send us an email on virtual.events at foundry.com. We also have some new listings coming up for webinars and sessions, so you can have a look at those on our events page. You can keep up to date with us as well on social media or joining our Insights Hub as well, and also by signing up for our quarterly newsletter. So what do we have new for the new family? So we've got a couple of new articles on our Insights Hub. We've got some training material as well on Foundry Learn. We've got some Workflow Wednesday videos as well, and a couple of the on-demand webinars as well available in Satsup, so a useful place to have a couple um, articles and some training materials as well. I also wanted to um, give a massive shout out to our industry partners, um, Access VFX, Academy Software Foundation, um, AC, ACM SIGGRAPH, and BES. Um, if you're not part of them already, please make sure you are a part of them. It's a good way of networking in the industry, getting to know people. Um, so please make sure you show your support and you join these communities as well. Lastly, I also wanted to say a massive thank you to all the studios, um, to all the speakers who have so far participated um, at Foundry Virtual Events. Um, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us and with our audience as well. So finally, um, we're also doing a competition in today's session. So we're giving away five copies of um, digital compositing for film and video written by Steve. So the way you can win this is by letting us know if you want a copy by commenting in the chat tab. Uh, later on, we will do a random draw and we will contact the winners uh, via email as well afterwards. So that's it for me today. Thank you very much again for joining and I'm handing over to Christy. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Joyce. <laughs> um, so it's a couple, couple last bits to get us started. So I'm Christy. Hello, by the way. Um, so Foundry is hiring. We're looking for some lead and senior engineers on the Nuke and research teams in particular. Um, we're also looking for um, some new roles on our team. So you can come and join Anise and I on the Nuke team as a product designer. Um, we're also going to be advertising for some product management roles soon. So check out foundry.com slash careers you know, for the current listings and, and keep an eye out for some more coming soon. And lastly, before we get to Steve, um, exciting news hot off the presses today. Um, we've opened up the beta for Nuke 12.2, which is the next Nuke release for all users of Nuke um, that have current maintenance. Um, and that can be found on the link that's right there. So please give it a test. Let us know what you think and, and help us and keep making it better. All right, that is it for the slides. So we can hand over now to Anise. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I am Anais, Associate Product Manager on the NUC team. Um, I want to start thanking everyone for joining. Uh, we have a great session. We have Steve Wright with us. I'm assuming that everyone here knows who is Steve Wright, but just in case. <laughs> Steve is an expert on digital compositing and NUC with over 20 years of experience and many, many credits on feature films. He's also an instructor and has many tutorials and courses for beginners and advanced artists. And you can get more information about his courses on his website, which is fxeacademy.com. He's as well the author of the book, Digital Compositing for Film and Video, the one that you may be able to get the chance to get today. <laughs> which is now on its fourth edition, which for what I know is like a complete rewrite with many new things, scripts and examples. And I will be asking him a few things about the book and many other questions that I have, but feel free to, to ask any questions if you want to on the chat and you know we can jump to those questions whenever, you, whenever we think that that's a very good question for Steve. Great. So um, <laughs> thank you for having us, Steve. Thank you for 
joining us on this session. And I got many questions, but the one that I'm thinking the most is, how many artists do you think that you have trained over over the years? How many compositors? Well, um, personally, you know, like in person, uh, somewhere around 1,200. Uh, virtually untold thousands, because I have stuff on lynda.com, hundreds of uh, tutorials on lynda.com that have been viewed by tens of thousands of artists. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> what made you decide to switch to, to Nuke when you, when you were working already as a compositor? Uh, what made you decide to change towards Nuke? Well, I, I switched to teaching and training when I got laid off from CineSight. They shut down the, the visual effects at CineSight. Actually, they, that's an interesting story. They shut down the visual effects, but they kept the digital intermediate pipeline there. So, so when CineSight Hollywood closed, they laid off every single artist except me. The digital intermediate department wanted to keep me as the go-to guy for image processing problems. Okay, so I hung around another two years. Okay, but eventually they got tired of me and I got laid off from CineSight and I went into teaching and training full time. Now I had already published the book, so I was getting, you know, some calls and, and letters from uh, cards from people. So um, I was teaching Shake and I've been teaching it for a couple of years. And uh, right around in 2008, I asked myself, what's the next big new thing in compositing? And I, I said, I said, well, it's 3D compositing. That's really the next big thing. Shake had a little two and a half D thing, you know, but it wasn't a serious 3D environment. So I was at the NAB show in 2008. I marched up to the NAB booth. I grabbed the VP of marketing and I said, I want to teach Nuke. And he said, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, here was the problem in 2008. The foundry had taken over uh, Nuke. But when they tried to sell it to a studio, the first question the studio asked was, where do I get uh, trained artists? And the only answer was digital domain. Okay, so <laughs> the foundry loaded me up with engineers, software, documentation, anything I needed, everything I needed, and to help me, you know, bootstrap up quickly, and the rest is history. Oh, that's fantastic. So other than having your support as the, uh you know, the first leading Nuke trainer. What do you what do you think it is about Nuke that's led it to becoming, you know, the industry standard that it is today? Well, it's it's several things. It's not just one thing. Um, I, I, one of the, the pillars of Nuke's wonderfulness is its engine. The 32-bit floating point linear color space engine is just brilliant. And the speed is very fast. Another factor, and again, like I said, it's not one answer, okay? The other factor is the robustness of the package. It can do camera tracking, we can do point tracking, we can do grid work, we can all kinds of tools and features and functions. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is that it is specifically designed for immensely complicated compositing shots. Unlike like After Effects, you know, you get two little things going and it all falls down, you can't, After Effects, is not designed. I'll never forget, I was at the NAB show, I was in the Foundry booth, and the guys that did Gravity, remember Gravity, that big long opening sequence, all one take? Beautiful. They were there, and they brought their nuke script, 15,000 nodes, <laughs> and it never crashed. I mean, That's, this is astonishing. It is amazing. Yeah, amazing. it is amazing. So the stability of the software is critical. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, when I first got into it, I read the specs. Okay, so it says here, uh, the maximum size image is 64K by 64K. Are you kidding me? Can it really do that? So I sat down and I made myself a 64K by 64K image. I stuck it in Nuke's face and I said, okay, rotate that. <laughs> and it did. Okay. And another, another thing that makes it very important is Certainly you guys, the foundry, uh, you guys listen, okay? And, and your customers say, you know, I need particle systems, you put in particle systems. They say, I need EXR file support, you put in EXR file, EXR file support. So the responsiveness of the foundry is another 
critical component. Oh. Other Thank than you, that, Steve. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I love it. Thank you, Steve. That's really um, so many wonderful things about you. And Gosh. You well, think? You know, because I, I travel around, I'm in different <laughs> studios, I talk to a lot, you know, kind of, I get kind of a God's eye view, and you know, so I hear people, so I get a good view of, of uh, what's going on. Mm. Yeah, and you would think that 64K is a lot, but you, you wouldn't believe that we've gotten requests for more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that'll be a tough one because that number is undoubtedly baked into the architecture of the software. Yeah, and it's it's a lot of pixels, right? Well, it's you know, you've got processor issues, and you'd have to you'd have to fix a <laughs> lot of different parts of the software to make that work. Wow, mm. <laughs> there is a future challenge for sure. Yes. So. Let's talk a little bit about your experience teaching mm -hmm. Nuke and, and what that's like. Mm -hmm. So one of one of the companies that you worked with and in, 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 you know, working with them to adopt Nuke was Pixar. Mm -hmm. What was it like working with, with those guys? That was really a trip. Um, I, I was actually there twice. They, they, they wanted to nuke up. Okay. I love it. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so, so they call me in and, and, uh, so I, I go into a conference room and, and there's like 40 people around this giant conference table. I'm like, what the hell? I thought I was going to meet Fred and we were going to talk about you, right? <laughs> this huge conference room full of guys and they go around introducing themselves, you know, and who they are and what they are and describing why they want to nuke up, okay? It seems that the, the architecture of Pixar's pipeline was they did everything in camera, okay? which means they rendered everything on the render farm. They didn't do anything in post. And I said, wow, that, that would take a staggering amount of rendering power. And they just smiled and said, we have a staggering amount of rendering power. <laughs> <laughs> so it turned out the backstory was, yes, we like to render in camera, but when the director says, you know, I'd like to see a little more spec. See, what they did was their their philosophy was photorealism. Okay, so the reflection on the side of a car was the real reflection. Hmm. But what was happening was the directors, those darn creative directors, said, "Why well, oh, this the reflections kicked up a little more?" Well, but that's real. I you know, I want more reflections. So they began to realize. The Compositing the shot in Nuke after the render was the way to go for not only creative flexibility, but production time. Because mm. no matter how many blades you got, it still takes time to render those shots. So they could re-render that shot with more reflections in, you know, 12 hours. I can put more reflections in 12 minutes. <laughs> Amazing, yeah, that's great. And well, Pixar still use Nuke, <laughs> still using it, and um, no they're all no <laughs> they're all so lovely. They're the really fantastic people there. And did yeah. you did you enjoy that office? Oh, the, the, the lobby there with all the. <laughs> it was, I went into the the Pixar toy store and got all kind of uh, memorabilia. <laughs> in fact, in, in my notebook, I carried the the stickers, you know, the security stickers from Pixar. They were in my notebook, and I kept them there for years as a souvenir. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! I do the same. My notebooks get full of the stickers from uh, the right. name badge. And the... Like like a steamer trunk with all the <laughs> stickers. <laughs> all the places. <laughs> yeah. But no, they're, they're very cool. They're very proud. Okay, they're very proud. Okay, I have a feeling that if you got a job there, it would take a decade before you were considered part of the family. Aww. Okay, because they have, you know, so much history, so much mm. going on. Yeah, they're all, well, it is a legacy. And a lot of yeah. smart people all there. So. Yeah, they're, they're, they're brilliant and, and wonderfully talented people. Okay, mm. not just smart, but very talented. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So that's it's a great story about Pixar. Oh, you know, when you're when you're teaching other, you know, kind of in your broader teaching experience, what are you know some of the common questions or the the challenges that come up time and again when you see artists learning Nuke? Well, for, for beginners learning Nuke, um, the the biggest thing is getting their heads around color. Mm. 
understanding digital color, color management, color theory, okay, yikes, and this whole linear light space thing, what the heck is that anyway? So, <laughs> okay, so great story about the linear light space. When I first got into Nuke, I read the white papers on the linear light space, right? And I went, oh, this is it. This is the answer. Because I was at CineSight for eight years, and CineSight had developed an all log pipeline. You know, we scan the film in log space, you know, the Cine, the Cine on file, all the software worked in log space. Everything was log, 10 bit log. Well, we tried eventually, they started needing to put CGI in with the visual effects shots. And so they hired, you know, CGI guys to write software. They never got it right. They were never able to render a linear image, you know, in the in Maya and composite it into a log image. They never got it right. So when I read, read the white paper, I went, that's it. That's why they couldn't get it right. To do it right, you have to be in linear and you have to be in float. And our entire pipeline was 10 bit integer. Mm. They were never going to get it. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's understanding the, this whole color space, linear light space thing. You know, how is it that 50% gray is code value 0.18? What? That, that's insane. That, that can't be right. Okay. The other thing that, that true beginners have trouble with is the layers and the channels and you know, all of that. You know, what the heck? Oh, I guess it's time to mow the lawn in the uh, in the neighborhood here. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's always right when you're on a call, isn't it? That's, right. that's when they decide. Well, in fact, I call to let them know, hey, I'm, I'm going online. Oh, okay, we'll be right over. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, the, 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 the channels and, and, and all of that, and uh, then the, I guess the other big issue, of course, is key. Mm. That's a perpetual grand topic, okay? <laughs> You can never be good enough at keying. And talking about all the compositing techniques, um, mm -hmm. is, there, is there any technique that you, do you enjoy teaching the most in your courses? Oh, technique I enjoy teaching? Well, yeah. Um, I enjoy, frankly, now that you mention it, I enjoy teaching um, correcting the green screen, screen correction with green screens. You know, where, where the, the background is all wonky and it's dark over in this corner and I have a process called screen correction that <laughs> snaps everything to one solid, clean, perfect level. Watching their eyeballs pop out when that happens is a lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know if we should take any, any questions. I may go for my next ones, but feel yeah, free to. There's, I think there's one here that's actually related to correcting green screens. Oh. And that is how tips for how to remove black or white edges in a green screen comp. Black and white edges in a green screen comp? Mm -hmm. You should, I don't understand. You shouldn't have any black and white edges in a green screen comp. <laughs> I don't understand the question. Mm -hmm. um, are you, are you sit here? Um, let's see. Um, okay. Would you reread the question, please? It's, that is it, how to remove black or white edges in a green screen comp. Let's see if someone else writes it in again. Okay. Um, they might be talking about when you key something and comp it, having uh, edges around your character. Mm. Yeah, I think it sounds like edge management here. Exactly so. That, that's what I, th that's what mm. I think uh, this means. Uh, if they're black edges, um, I, I would look to check that you had done a double pre-multiply somewhere. Mm. That'll introduce black edges. Okay, if you got light edges, okay, uh, then I would check your despill operation. Okay, see if you're got, okay. Or get out that edge extend node, okay, that just came out in new 12 and fill those white edges with RGB values, okay, from the adjacent pixels, okay. Mm -hmm. I love, the, I used to do the blur and unpremultiply gag, okay, mm -hmm. and, and, Tragically, I used to teach that, and, and that was another jaw hanger, okay? You guys took it away from me. <laughs> <laughs> I put it out the edge extend node. In fact, it's in my book. I, I have the, the blur and unpremultiply in, in the book, mm. this fourth edition, and I think somebody there read that, okay? I think. <laughs> 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 I 
hey, we could do it better. It is better. <laughs> your, your node is better than doing a blur and unpremultiply. Fewer oh. artifacts. Well, thank you. We had, we had to keep changing it up so there's new things to learn, right? Always. And new things to teach. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, so, should we? I guess you want to go to the next questions about um, like tips for artists. Artists, yeah, coming in. So yeah. Basically, what do you think there are like the um, what resources would you suggest for new for new artists that want to learn new? I'm sorry. Say what? Sorry. What resources would you suggest? Oh, oh resources. Yes. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I would rec recommend a Sterling book. <laughs> <laughs> the, thing, the thing about my book is it doesn't teach nuke, it teaches compositing. Mm. And the problem with too many beginners in compositing is they think, well, if I learn where the buttons and knobs are on the app, I know how to composite. No. No. There are three bodies of knowledge to being a visual effects artist, to being a composer. One is knowing your tools. That's the buttons and knobs on the app. Mm -hmm. Two, technique. What's the right approach to this problem? Any problem, there you got a half a dozen possible solutions to any given problem. So you want to you know, pick the right technique to solve that problem. Third, art. Compositors are artists. And you have to have some artistic skill and some artistic training. So. If you want to get into this, what I would recommend is, first of all, get some art. Photography would be ideal, filmmaking, painting, drawing, any, you know, anything artsy. Um, and then learn about, like my book, learn about compositing, learn about filmmaking, because we're, we're not really just dealing with an array of pixels and, and 2D processors. We're making a shot that came from a camera. And you have to understand cameras and camera work, scene composition, blocking, okay, uh, in order to be a, a really good compositor. So color, color, understanding color. Okay, so that's, that's the number one thing I hear when I go to a studio and say, okay, what's wrong with your new hires? They don't know anything about color. Okay. <laughs> the, are there... I are just there's... haven't had a, a dazzling webinar on digital color on my website. If you don't mind. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Oh. <laughs> like, are there like when you think about color? Like, are there specific things that that um, like where the knowledge is missing? Is it like is it general color management? Is it things like Open Color IO or Aces? Like, what are the like specific things that artists should look at learning? Well, uh, one of the one of the big challenges to an artist is how do I color correct these two things so that they they look integrated mm -hmm. photorealistic color correction okay mm -hmm. that's that's one of the big issues a, an astonishing number of artists do not understand the difference between lift gamma and gain well you need to know what those operations do on a mathematical level what are they doing to my pixels not not mm -hmm. just you know how it looks on the screen but you also need to know what visual effect it's going to have. Mm. Okay. So, which is why in the fourth edition of my book, I put in, <laughs> I put in a section on the, the, the color adjustments, okay? Mm. What, what do they do mathematically? How do they look visually when you use this one and not that one? Okay, so that's that's the main thing is knowing how what each color operation. I, I got some clouds. I want to tweak the clouds, but I don't really want to get the skin tone. How do I do that? Which is is that a gain? Is that you know an offset? What what's the right adjustment for that? So that's that's uh, kind of what the big issues are, um, and also um, the artists don't understand. Uh, the linear workspace vis-a-vis -vis the display space, sRGB, Rec. 709, P3, mm -hmm. okay, the, the relationship, and then what are these log images coming out of my camera? What is that? Why are they doing log? Okay, that's just crazy talk. So the, that whole color thing is, is difficult for artists. Mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. Yeah, fundamentals of you know, what comes out of the camera and how you're transforming it. That mm -hmm. definitely makes sense that you want to learn. Right.
Should I go again for one of my questions? Yeah, go for it, Anise. Okay, I'm, I'm actually going to jump into your book. I'm curious, you know, what is new in your in the fourth edition of the oh, digital wow. positive? Oh, oh. Funny you should mention that. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, this is the fourth edition, and the, our damn industry keeps evolving, so the publisher keeps beating on me for a, another book, right? <laughs> uh, okay, th this is a major rewrite. First of all, I dumped all the stuff on film. There's mm -hmm. no more 35 millimeter film in the book. Now, for those who love nostalgia, I did make a PDF file, uploaded it to the publisher's uh, server so that you can actually download a PDF with all that film stuff. Nice. The other thing I dumped was all the NTSC video, you know, <laughs> interlace video, non-square pixels, pal, NTSC, gone. But I also uploaded that as a PDF so you could, you know, if you really want, if somebody hands you some old, um, actually there's three television standards. There's conventional def, standard def, and high def, okay? <laughs> and uh, conventional def is the old NTS, that's the new word for the old NTSC stuff. So those are out, boom, in digital cinema cameras, Bayer arrays, debayering, okay? Also, I put in a whole, uh, some other tech, okay? I talked about ACEs, I talked about, um, uh, OCIO and uh, also about the um, light field cinematography. Okay, I have a mm -hmm. whole section on light field cinematography. Uh, VR, I, I, I had a section on VR and how to do visual effects on a VR piece. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but then I also added a whole bunch of workflow stuff. You know, I, I'm always thinking of the compositor sitting in a chair staring at a screen going, yikes. <laughs> okay. um, so I have in there workflows for grain management. Here's how you manage your grain, okay? Lens distortion management, okay? Multiple, multiple keying techniques, creating the Uber key, multiple spill suppression methodologies, okay? So, um, that's the, the big issue, is having all these workflows, how to do stuff, okay, rather than just, oh, these are pixels, and this is what they do, and you can make them brighter, and you can make, you can blur them, you know, how to do stuff. That's the big, the big issue. And um, I heard you talking about your shot kits. Uh, what exactly, what exactly are your oh, shot kits? shot kits. Yes. Shot kits. Okay, this is a, a an idea I got, and, and I went and did it. Uh, it goes like this. You're a compositor, you're working in a studio, you finished a movie, you wanna put on your demo reel. You can't have the elements. The studios won't let you have the plates. Security mm -hmm. reasons. You, all you can do is go grab a DVD or a Blu-ray, burn off your shot, and then maybe put arrows saying, I did this, I did that, but you can't do the befores and afters of a shot breakdown. And I said, that's no fair. You have to have the elements if you want to show an employer, not that you could do it, but that you have done it. So shot kits are a pack of, of film plates, all feature film resolution, feature film quality. This is all red stuff. This is all airy stuff, 35 millimeter film. Mm -hmm. Real effects shots that you put together and put on your demo reel. Okay, now some of them are skill-based. Here, this is my keying uh, example, or here, this, this is my, uh, my demonstrating my ability to key fast motion blur. Okay, I've got some action shots in there, you know, so you get a lot of motion blur and flying hair and stuff like that. But I also put in some shots designed to let you show off your creative ability. The, uh, the sci-fi series and the zombie uh, series, the horror series, you get to make up your horrific makeup, okay, or you get to design laser blast rays, or you get to design deflector shields to enhance, you know, I give you the green screen, I give you the CGI environment, you blow it up. <laughs> so there's a chance to show off your creative ability. Okay. Also, I got uh, another one I call key packs. Um, one of the things that, that uh, about keying, learning green screen keying, it takes 
practice. You can't read the book, you can't do the tutorial, then sit down and key the shot. You can't. It takes practice. You have to sit down with a hundred green screens and a key light load and key one after another after another until finally you get it. Also, when next time you walk up to a green screen, you'll go, aha, I know exactly how to key that. The other thing is that every keyer has its own unique strengths and weaknesses. You must mm -hmm. learn those. So now you can look at a shot and say, okay, this is key light. See that sign here, detail? I'm using key light on this. Mm -hmm. Or, hmm, I'm going to have trouble with the core mat. I better use prime mat. It's really good at solid cores. Or do you see that uneven green screen backing there? IBK. This is IBK. Okay. So you've got to learn your keyers, their strengths and their weaknesses, and when to use them. Okay. And then you got to learn to use them in combination. Well, IBK is great for the hair, Primat great for the core, you know, and you start bolting and cutting and pasting things together. <laughs> That's it. So the, se the secret to keep being really familiar with your ears and getting that is getting one experience. secret. That is one secret. The other uh, secret number two out of seven is spill suppression. Mm. So many of our bad edges come from spill suppression problems. So you need to understand it and have alternatives. Okay. I've actually developed a couple of different spill suppression uh, algorithms. Okay. Uh, Nuke has the Hue Correct node, and that is their tool for spill suppression. And, and it does a very nice job. Uh, but sometimes you need alternatives. The thing to remember about keying and spill suppression, both, they're both a cheat. They are mathematically invalid. Okay? Key light pulling a green screen key is not mathematically correct. It's a cheat that works pretty darn well most of the time, okay? Mm. And spill suppression is also a cheat. You are not actually removing the three-dimensional light rays that have bounced around, collected, mixed with my hair and on my shirt. You are, not, you are simply ripping RGB values off the picture, off the screen, okay? So they are a cheat that works pretty well most of the time. So you gotta have uh, understanding of it and alternatives. No ways to work around it. <laughs> I'm just trying to read some of the questions that people have been uh, posting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that we can, if we go by the most upvoted, so that the top one that we've not answered yet is, <laughs> is there a clear ACES workflow tutorial for replacing the Rec 709 workflow? Uh, I don't have one, no, no. Um, Rec, Rec 709 is your video. Um, ACES is, the good news is, first of all, ACES is wonderful. That is the answer. Mm -hmm. ACES is the answer for visual effects. Like the EXR file was designed by ILM for compositors, okay? <laughs> I could put my film scan in there, and I could put all my layers and my CGI in there define the layers, name them. They were made for compositing. Mm. Well, ACES is made for our world of visual effects. I'll tell you a great story. I went to a webinar, uh, a, 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 well, not a webinar, but a, um, a, a session um, by Charles Poynton. Charles Poynton is a leading color scientist. Mm -hmm. Color science has always been a hobby of mine. So I went to his, web, his seminar, paid 600 bucks. And there was only about a dozen people in the audience. And the first thing that happened was some kid raised his hand and said, oh, Mr. Poynton, why do we need color science? And Charles just sort of, uh, uh, he was just caught flat-footed by such, you know, a bold question. So I raised my hand and he said, yeah, you, you, okay. I said, if you're working in a closed pipeline, video in, video out, film in, film out, you don't need color science. It's all been taken care of for you. The minute you cross between color pipelines, you need color science. And today, I might be compositing a shot that has a background plate shot on a digital cinema camera, a CG element that was rendered in linear, in, in linear 
-hmm. I might have a piece of video that's Rick 709 to put into a monitor insert shot and a picture of my mom off the internet. And I got to put them all, all together in one shot and I got to convince you that they were all shot together at the same time under the same lighting with the same camera and the same lens. Okay? We need color science. ACES is the answer to that. ACES takes Nuke's linear light space to the next level. Okay, Nuke pulls out all of the LUTs that are baked into your Rec. 709, your sRGB, and, and all of that, backs it out to, uh, to linearize the image, but it doesn't finish the job. Left into that picture is the footprint of the camera that took the picture. Every camera has a bias. It, this one puts in too much red, that one you know, drops the blacks too dark, whatever. ACES backs out the camera's attributes from the original captured image to produce a scene-referred light image. Theoretically, those pixels represent the actual light of the actual scene, not as seen by the camera, but the original scene. That's the whole secret of ACES. Then we do all of our work in that space, and then we output it into any number of... The other key to ACES is it has a gigantic workspace, okay? The mm -hmm. color range of ACES is far beyond human perception and far beyond any piece of equipment we could build or buy today, okay? Uh, so it future-proofs your work your, if, you, if you work in ACES. So what ACES allows you to do is mix and match different inputs from different, or two different cameras on the movie and make them look the same. Okay, so that's that's the power of ACES. Mm -hmm. So similarly, huh? So similarly to ACES, and thinking about wider ranges of color. So here's mm -hmm. a question from Rob Bannister um, around resources. That if there's any that you'd recommend for working with HDR. Now well, this H is used more. <laughs> ah, well, well, HDR, you know, high dynamic range addresses. Mm -hmm brightness ranges, if you're talking about an expanded gamut, that's a different mm -hmm. subject, okay? Uh, the gamut is, where are your color primaries? You know, how red is your red and how blue is your blue, okay? The CIE chromaticity diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, get ready for Rec 2020, people, okay? Rec 2020, are you sitting down, has a wider gamut than P3, which is your digital cinema color space. So the world is getting ready for that. The TV manufacturers are all tooling up, trying to produce TVs. I can't wait. I cannot wait till I have a Rec 2020 TV with super blacks, okay? A dynamic range of a million to one <laughs> and expanded primary uh, colors. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I think, you know, more than high resolution, HDR is a real impact, like when you see it, it's a huge difference, right, for us, consumer, yes. as well as um, for artists, right, working with images. Right. Something that we're working on, we <laughs> have a stream yes. of work related to this, and yeah, eventually, right. Yes, yeah, but support. that's expanded gamut, okay? Mm -hmm. The range of colors, high dynamic range is of extended brightness, okay? Mm -hmm. I got a code value of 10 million, the center of the sun. You know? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Um, let's see. So the next one here, totally different topic. Well, yeah, totally different. And that is about deep compositing. Oh, yes. Workflow tips for working with deep. Workflow tips? Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> well, you know, deep is set up unique to each pipeline. Okay. Uh, some, some shops, we do everything deep. Other shops, they'll just pick the money shots, okay, and just do those in deep. Um, so as far as tips for working in deep, use Nuke. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, that is, that is the answer. Um, is, is there anything for, for artists that you recommend they think about differently when approaching deep versus a you know, traditional like 2D or 3D kind of data? I'm sorry, what is the question? 
Um, any, I guess, is it when artists start working in deep or learning about how to work in deep, is there anything that you would like advise them to think about differently or to have in their mind, you know, compared to working with 2D or 3D data? Oh, oh, oh. Instead, compared to working flat, what we call yes. flat. Yeah. Oh, okay, flat versus deep. Yeah. Um, well, the lovely thing about deep is you don't have to worry about your layering orders anymore. Mm. Okay. Um, the thing, the thing, the way I explain it to people is, I got two, three, four, five, seventeen images in this comp, but each pixel knows exactly where he lives in that world. Mm. Okay. So, imagine if you're doing a standard flat comp. Okay. I got a flock of birds flying through uh, the branches of a tree. Oh my God, this bird goes behind this limb, but in front of that limb and behind that, oh geez, and there's 50 birds and there's you know 25 limbs. It's a hopeless layering order problem, okay? Mm. But deep solves it natively. Absolutely no work, no concern, because it sorts itself out. Of course, what you'll have to do, if the birds were CG rendered deep, and that tree was a live action tree, you're going to have to paint a deep map. <laughs> okay. Uh, but if it's all CG, you're golden. I think that I saw another question about um, what is your best advice for those coming to Nuke from After Effects? Okay. Um, my best advice is tray, tray tables up, seat backs upright. Uh, it is a completely different paradigm, okay? Uh, Nuke is very hard on your head until you get it, until you get the... Because After Effects um, is a layer-based compositing system. It was designed to go along with Adobe Photoshop. You were supposed to use After Effects to fly logos around the screen, okay? That was the original inception. So. What they do is they put the timeline in your face, right? Right. The timeline is the center of the universe with this because you're flying stuff around the screen. Okay. Over the years, people keep enhancing it and adding to it and beefing it up, and okay, and they and they keep bolting new things onto it, and it's grown like a weed. But it's still a layer-based system, focusing on the timeline. Okay. That's what we. The other thing about After Effects is, like Photoshop, After Effects hides the technology from the poor little artist. Okay, we don't want to bother your poor little head with all these, you know, alpha channels and masking and stuff and things. So just don't worry about it. We'll just take care of it for you. And do a very nice job until you want to do something that After Effects doesn't do. And then you're trying to outsmart After Effects' native behaviors. You can get into great trouble. Okay with Nuke. Nuke is naked. Nuke puts all the tools on the table. You have to put them together to make something. I remember I was doing um, <laughs> fusion transition training for a studio in, in uh, Mumbai. They were, they were all going from fusion to Nuke. And they said, well, in, in fusion, I've got a fog node. I, I can just make fog. Here, watch this. Fog, fog. Can you do that in Nuke? Well, no, but give me a minute. Five nodes later, I had fog. Okay? Cubic fog, volumetric fog. Okay. So Nuke, you, Nuke expects you to know mathematics. I'm scaring people. <laughs> <laughs> Nuke expects you to understand mathematics, compositing, mm -hmm. art, color. Okay? Um, Nuke expects more of the artist than After Effects, who tries to hide it from you. So Nuke, what's not, with, with, with After Effects, it's the timeline that's, that's in your face. With Nuke, it's the data flow that's in your face, okay? You look at a Nuke script and you're looking at a schematic diagram for the flow of the data. It's gonna come in here, it's gonna get blurred, it'll go over there, it'll get color corrected, come down here, it'll be joined with that and you get a schematic of the logic of the shot. And that is the overarching concept behind Nuke. Okay, is it, it puts the, Nuke is, in the world of computer science, 
Nuke is what we would call data flow programming. It's all about the data moving from here to there. Okay. So the After Effects artist, um, to, to, to close on the question, uh, is, is to be ready for a completely different paradigm. Okay. Mm. Um, and it'll take a little while for you to get your head around uh, Nuke Think. Okay. <laughs> Be ready for a ride of that. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so I was just going to ask about the coronavirus. Sorry for everyone for <laughs> bringing the topic. Um, I'm not. I don't have it. Do you see any long term changes? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, the coronavirus kind of forced the industry. Uh, to, to suddenly snap to a virtual model. Now, there was, a, there was a fair amount, a little bit of that before, but Corona forced it on the industry, okay? And what's gonna happen is, after Corona's gone, some of that is gonna stick. We're gonna stay more virtual, which is great news for, for, for artists because now you could be a man in a machine at home. I don't have to move to Madrid or, or New Zealand or God help me, Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love Montreal, it's crazy. But, but uh, okay, I mean, I, I remember years ago, I was talking to um, an agent. Uh, who, who is that guy, the, the, the famous agent? He's an agent for visual effects compositors. And he said, what you need is a resume and a visa. Okay, if you want to work in the industry now. So that is becoming less true now because we're, some of this remote, it has forced the company to buy the equipment, develop the workflows, figure out the problems, come up with solutions, solve the security issues. Okay, force them to do that. And now, once the corona is gone, they're going to say, well, do we really need 75 guys sitting in this room with air conditioning and... Um, you know, a snack room and restrooms and all that jazz. Um, maybe we could cut it down to 10 and have 40 virtual artists. So it also, the, the, this whole virtual thing and the man in the machine, you know, you're working at home, uh, works very well with the business model of visual effects. And that is this. I had my own studio for 10 years in Hollywood. And the problem is uneven workflow, okay? You get a big project, you're going like gangbusters, and the project finishes, the movie's done. But I don't want to lay these people off, okay? So now you've got this big fixed overhead and no income. So it's a terrible, terrible scenario. Well, with this, you know, people are working at home. When the project's over, it's over, okay? Now maybe there's another gig. Maybe they can go work for another studio. But they don't have to go rent an apartment in another city, that's the key. It's also more cost effective and efficient if the studio manages it correctly. Less fixed overhead. Um, do you see any any trends in the industry? Like no, no trends, no. <laughs> well, working remotely, uh, of course, is a big trend. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. I remember, remember I, I've been in this industry for a very long time, okay? I remember sitting in the SIGGRAPH watching, oh my God, rigid body deformations. Wow! Okay. <laughs> I worked at Robert Abel and Associates. Probably nobody out there even knows who that is anymore. They developed the first ray tracing software. This was in the days when you wrote the software to do the commercial, okay? So I've been in the industry at a very early stage and what it's been is this staggeringly rapid evolution, everything changing and new features and new function out. I remember um, AT&T actually put out a real-time ray tracing box that you could purchase, okay? <laughs> so that was a big story back then. But uh, the, the, the recent trends today are for ACEs, 
lot, lot of studios are moving to aces, okay? So I recommend uh, all the folks out there become aces happy, okay? Uh, come up to speed with OCIO. Again, we're doing color again, right? Um, I don't, I don't know that deep compositing is, is going to be a huge, okay, so I mean, the big, the Transformers movies, the King Kongs, sure. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for just uh, your generic, especially for television, okay, broadcast. Broadcast is doing a hell of a lot of neat stuff, okay? And they haven't got the schedule or the resources to do a lot of, deep, they can do some deep, okay? But for the most part, uh, broadcast television is on a very tight schedule. They have to work faster. Their, their standards or specs are not as high as a feature film. Okay. So um, that's another area where uh, being fast, being I, I teach my students, speed is life in the world of visual effects. You have to be a quick compositor. You're working, uh, the, the job is shutting down. Management is trying to figure, who are we going to keep? Who's going to go? Fred does twice as many jobs as Ralph in the same amount of time. We're going to keep Fred. Okay, sorry, Ralph. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, productivity is a critical issue. So the, the trends are towards being very productive, um, being comfortable with aces, um, being able to do photorealistic color correction without bothering the comp super, okay. <laughs> um, you were just mentioning that you have been like in the industry for quite some time. Um, where do you see the, the compositing being like, where do you see this movement like changing in 10 years? Where do you see compositing? Wow, um, I, see, I see it getting even more powerful. I'll never forget one time uh, I, I was at a, um, a post-mortem on uh, Night of the Museum 3, okay, the, the producers and the directors and the uh, VFX supervisor, they were telling him how we did Night at the Museum 3. I worked on Night of the Museum 2, so I was interested in their story. So the thing that struck me was what, they, what the, the uh, VFX super said was, we rendered our CG lighting passes we, without, we didn't, we didn't sit fuss over them. You know, oh, let's re-render the specular layer. You know, oh, let's redo the ambient. They just blasted them out and handed it to the compers. And the compers gave it the final look. That's the punchline. That is a more efficient pipeline. Okay? Don't re-rendering is expensive. Okay, re-rendering this, this uh, plate could take hours, if not days, but the composite, I hate comper. I don't have comper anymore. I'm a compositor, okay? Uh, <laughs> um, the compositor can dial up that specular pass and recomposite the shot and be showing it to you in 15 minutes, not 15 hours, okay? So the trend, the overarching trend, as I see off into the distance, is more and more stuff being moved from 3D into 2D. I think we got like a few minutes left, so um, I'm going to jump with actually Nuke. Do you have any favorite feature on Nuke 12? Oh, my goodness. Uh, that's like asking a child what his favorite <laughs> Christmas present was. Um, <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I love the grid warp tracker. I love that thing. That, that is so cool. Uh, and it's quick and easy to use. Uh, but I think the most useful, and I found more damn uses for that edge extend thing. I use it for much more than just fixing the edges of a bum key. Okay, I've got all kinds of nifty uses for that guy. So I guess I have to say my favorite new toy is the edge extension node. <laughs> yes, nice. That's a nice one. Um, so, okay. You are in front of two people that work at Nuke, so it's your chance to. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is there any feature that you would like to see in Nuke in the future? Well, remember, I teach artists where the studio is going to say, hey, we want to add these new things, okay, to give me more capability, more speed. 
Uh, I think the the one change I would love to see in Nuke is <laughs> this sounds really petty. The playhead is sitting on frame one, and I tell it to jump to the first. Oh, you've heard this. <laughs> you know about this. Sorry, I, say, I know where this is going. Frame. Let you go. Yeah. All right. So jump forward. You know, ten frames. Skip forward. <clears throat> you have to move it off of frame one before it'll do any of that, and that vexes me mightily. <laughs> that distresses me. <laughs> Taking notes, not the first time that we. Have I bet I, she started laughing when I, when I brought it up. You've heard this before, <laughs> but the big studios are gonna gonna give you the the new features they want to see. You know. Yeah. Um, My I, needs are small. <laughs> <laughs> um, Christy, do we have time for any any last question on the chat? Yeah, I mean, I think there's one that's interesting that's tied a bit into um, this this future trends bit, and that is, what is your view on AI, machine learning, and VFX? Okay, artificial intelligence. Um, okay, I, it's overrated for visual effects, okay? I don't think we have anything to worry about for a long time. They want to use AI for rotoscoping. They want to use AI for keying. Okay. Uh, the problem is that the equation is too complex. It takes judgment. Mm. Okay. Um, you got a motion blur. You know what's the rotoscope? What is the exact? Eh, that's it. Takes judgment. It takes experience. Okay. I know AI can learn and AI can get experience, but. Um, I think it'll be a long time before AI will be a significant contributor to visual effects. Mm. I love AI, don't get me wrong. And it has marvelous applications in many situations. It's just, well, I don't see it for this for, for a long time. Great. Um, there's another one here that's kind of also related to the future. And I, I'm also personally interested to know what you think about this one. And mm -hmm. that is about virtual production. I mean, and is that going to change or reduce the work of compositors? Well, you mean, that's what we were talking about earlier, was mm -hmm. spreading the shop out. And, and, and no, it doesn't, it, it, it moves it around, but it doesn't reduce the amount of work for compositors, okay? That's mm -hmm. the man and a machine thing I was talking about. Uh, um, yes. You it, now have, you know, you, your, your, your big bad tower and your nuke license, you are a one man production studio that you can sit at home and make a good living without moving to Montreal, mm. <laughs> not to <become> Montreal. <laughs> okay. So, um, I see that as a, uh, a really good future for a lot of artists moving into this remote production scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think you've actually answered a lot of questions already. Oh dear. It's great. <laughs> well, content rich webinar, huh? <laughs> yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, just with your oh here's another one specific one back to artist workflow. Oh, yes. Workarounds for the channel limit. You mean a thousand and twenty-four channels is not enough? Uh, I get a new job. <laughs> really? Is that is that the issue? Is a thousand and twenty-four channels is not enough? Mm. Oh dear. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's this case of like live groups and things where you have many things in the script. If I interpret this correctly, so where you add up that channel count and you run out. Um, cool. Mm. Mm. Wow, no, I don't. Uh, I don't have any clever workarounds for that. That's that sounds outrageous and, and awful. <laughs> Smarter channel management is, is the workaround. I think. Well, the, the one thing I have noticed the the channel delete node doesn't really delete the channel. It, it's still there. Okay. So um, it, it makes it difficult to repurpose things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, maybe increasing the um, efficacy and flexibility of the channel create and delete, you know, so you could reallocate. 
you can't change the 1023 channels. Because okay? that is endemic to the entire architecture of Nuke. You would have to go into every single nook and cranny of Nuke and rewrite that to make that 2048 channels. Okay, It would be a colossal architectural rewrite. So maybe you could put in some tools to allow well, to allow. Yeah, we could we could make it unlimited. That's definitely possible. Floating but it doesn't channels. make it easier to manage. You mean floating point yeah, uh, channels? Yeah, it can go away. <laughs> wow, but that again, that would be yeah. It doesn't change it doesn't change the challenge of managing it. Or how you work with that many channels well, in the script, right? Course. Which becomes the messy and hard yeah. and it impacts performance at a point. The complexity becomes overwhelming. In fact, you should cut down on the number of channels so that people will be more disciplined. Okay, they're wasting channels out there. I just know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did, I think it was, which release was it? I think eleven point three, we added the counter for channels, uh -huh. and you can have a warning. So you can have better self-management of your channels if right. you're getting close to the limit or if you're inside your pipeline we don't want anyone to work with more than so many channels yeah but again to go to a unlimited channels or to double from 1023 to 2047 would be a, a huge architectural rewrite of the software it would be monstrous mm -hmm. uh, Okay. okay. Anything else in here? Look like uh, um, Christy got uh, wiped out, huh? Yeah. Oh, I think that I can hear her, but um, I'll go for the next question. Yeah, please. We got one question for um, Jorge. It is, do you think tools like Fusion can become an edge rival to Nuke in the near future? Fusion become a rival? Um, no, I don't. And here's why. I, I know Black Magic essentially gives it away for free. And, and Fusion is getting better. Fusion is good. Fusion is great. And it's getting better. But there is another issue. And that is the installed base throughout all the visual effects studios around the world. They have wrapped themselves around Nuke. They have written custom software. They have designed the pipeline for Nuke. They got a hundred apps that they plug into Nuke, and to rip that out and go to Fusion would be a colossal rewrite of the whole architecture of the pipeline of the shop. Okay, so that that was years ago. I wrote an article on um, uh, Rhythm and Hughes. You remember Rhythm and Hughes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Their their forte was doing animal, you know, animal stuff, and they had written a whole bunch of custom software. And I wrote an article saying it would be the death of them because the, co the, the, the custom software, it's not expandable. It's not, a, you can have an engineering team constantly writing, constantly, but you need a big team. At Robert Abel's, we had 25 software engineers and 30 artists, okay? It is a colossal overhead to write your own software. So uh, I wrote an article saying essentially that they, they were dead meat because their software, they, if they, they can't drop in Nuke or Fusion or Shake, in those days it would have been Shake, and, and build on that because they were baked, it was baked into their entire pipeline. You don't just rip out the heart and drop in a new one, okay? The whole infrastructure surrounding the pipeline is hooked into Nuke. Christy, do you see any question then that you want to take? Should I go for the next one? Yeah, go for it. Oh, I see one that actually we didn't cover. Um, what would you say about Python learning for Nuke? Do it. I mean, if you're a, it's a way for an intermediate to become an advanced. It's a way for an advanced to be retained at the next job cycle. Um, not for junior people, okay? But Python is, being a Python scripter is a really great, very useful tool for the studio. Uh, probably more important for big shops, 
okay, than small shops. In small shops, you have to wear many hats. Uh, you know, you, you get a job at a small shop, you're going to do some compositing, you might do a little 3D, you might do some color stuff, you know, color correction. Uh, in the big shop, <laughs> my favorite, in the big studio, you have the hair guy, right? All he does is hair, okay? <laughs> That's how specialized it has gotten, but that's in the big studios. But Python is a, a wonderful tool that you can take Nuke and make it jump up on the table and dance. If you're a Python scripter, people, people, in fact, I've always thought if I ever get tired of this trend, I love programming, okay? I was a big Unix programmer when I had my uh, studio, and uh, uh, I really enjoy programming. Uh, and I always thought if I ever give up the training thing, I'll become a Python coder and write new Python stuff for people <laughs> and make a living that way, okay, because I love to code. But it's, it's not something appropriate for the junior, but for an intermediate who wants to become an advanced or for an advanced that wants to become really senior, adding Python would be an excellent skill adjunct. Okay. Hi. I think that we have answered like many, many questions. Is there anything that we didn't cover? Anything that I think that we we have replied the most liked questions, so the most questions. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I think that we can wrap up. Can I go now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's been really, really fantastic having you on, Steve. That you're, well, thank you. It's really, it's been a, a lovely chat. I really enjoyed it. And well, thank you very much. You're too kind. <laughs> oh, and thank you to everyone who joined us for so, so many great questions and so many good comments in the chat. Really, really great discussion today. Okay. Thank you so much for having me, Foundry. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Steve. Thank you. And stay safe out there, everyone. And Well, yeah, stay safe. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, again, thank you very much, Steve, for, for everything. And we're going to now choose the, the people that will be get, getting the, the books and we'll be contacting them. Right-ho. So, um, so all you guys out there that, that said, you have, to, you have to send in in the chat and say, yes, I want a book. And then the ladies here will paw through it and, and pick the most handsome guys to send the book to. <laughs> yes, and lots of people did write in, so we'll, we'll yeah. Uh, okay, we'll, cool. We'll go through and yeah, pick some winners. Very good, very good. Uh, yeah, I see many people actually keep texting. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Everything, and take care. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.